Well, good morning everyone and welcome. Uh, I just want to report that this meeting is being facilitated in accordance with the latest COVID restrictions for the North East, which came into effect at midnight. Uh, I've got no apologies to note, but I would like to welcome Catherine Byrne, our new Deputy Director of Nursing, who's here as an observer. So welcome, Catherine. If we move on then just to the Declaration of Interest, any board member who is aware of a private or personal conflict of interest relating to any item on the agenda will be required to disclose at this stage or when the conflict arises during consideration of the item. So we've got Paul, we've got Alison and we've got Stephen to note. So thanks for that. Then if we move on to the notes of the meeting of the 26th of August 2020, Again, I will take matters arising or inaccuracies on each page as we go forward, starting with page 3, page 4, page 5, page 6. Type on that, Jerry. Yeah. Second bullet point. I signed up, should be signed up. It should, yes. Right. Okay, thanks, Michael, for that. <coughs> Page seven, page eight. Yes, Chair, just one. Yeah. Page eight on the second paragraph, on about the fifth sentence from the bottom. This um, part of the sentence reads, had begun to be tested. I think that was referring to the fact that the Trust had begun its own testing and was agreed with the local cell. Okay, thanks, David. Page nine, just yes. on, sorry, page nine. Sorry. Marvin. Uh, third bullet point from the bottom that starts the trust to produce an agile working policy. Mm. Um, I just wonder if after that we could include um, through partnership working with staff side colleagues and led by Sudanese workforce compliance and then continue noting that um, Mr. Edge then produced the working safety policy because they are two distinct elements just for clarity. That would be okay, thank you, Barbara. Just on page nine, also the fourth bullet point, so there's reference to oxygen consumption yes. at Darlington, which will be resolved but by December. But in light of recent developments, uh, there's got to be no implication for lack of oxygen at Darlington Memorial Hospital. Um, we've started monitoring oxygen consumption again, given that our numbers of COVID patients have um, begun to increase and um, across the region. Um, Many of the organisations have higher numbers than we do, so we're expecting ours will increase further. We also have that work scheduled. You'll recall this was requested during the um, sort of March-April period, but we were put on a essentially a waiting list to um, have the work done, which will see a significant expansion in oxygen capacity at DMH. So we're expecting that that work um, will begin shortly and should conclude earlier than the December date which is was our best estimate yeah. mm -hmm. um, last month so I would imagine it should be completed by the end of October. That's great, thank you Sue. Page 10, 11, 12. It's just, um, it's just a point of, uh, it's just a matter arising really um, on the um, talk before you walk, is that starting to be any approved? So, talk before you walk hasn't really been launched in our patch yet so um, it's just been launched in the north so we aren't seeing any impact from it at this point okay thank you and just on page 12 is just a point of accuracy where it's referred to the IQAC preface it's refers to the meeting of the 28th of August should that be the 25th because our board meeting was on the 26th that's so, correct yeah. Yeah. Mm. It should be, okay, thank you for that. <coughs> Page 13, 14, 15, and then moving on to the action log. And then the action log, item number four, which is referring to the priority in the emergency department, and there is a paper attached which fully explains how patients are prioritised. There was a question that you asked, Paul, at the last meeting. So I presume that provides all the evidence you require. Very, very comprehensive. Okay, thanks for that. And then item number six, I refer to the duty of candour uh, that would be brought to this meeting. 
it's in the patient safety report. Okay, thank you, Noel, for that. And that's the only thing from the action log. So, is there anything from the last meeting that I've missed in terms? Of if not, then we'll move on to the next item, Sue, which is obviously taking us through to CEO update. Thank you. Um, so, taking first item um, 4A. In terms of national matters, the um, biggest bit of national work that's been undertaken over the weeks since the board last met was our preparation for the remainder of the year and a change in the arrangements that we have both for the activity that we need to deliver and the finances that was advised back in July in phase three <coughs> planning guidance, as the board will remember. Um, it really focuses on the three areas that I've highlighted on page two. So it um, encourages us to accelerate to near normal levels of non-COVID activity. We do have a session later this afternoon and we'll be able to um, explore this in more detail, but our current plans do not um, allow us to achieve these levels across the piece um, because of various restrictions, particularly around social distancing. And we know we're in a similar position to other trusts, but nevertheless, that is the target that we've been um, asked to work towards. There is a clear um, pointer to ensure that we manage our winter pressures alongside um, probable COVID spikes. I think it's fair to say we believe we're mm. at the beginning of a second spike now. Um, we've done a lot of work on our winter planning that's been to board and we're in a process where we've got some actions that have come out of a peer review of our plans um, that are being um, sort of topped and tailed as we speak and we'll be able to bring a further update to board next month. And then there was a lot of lessons in the first COVID spike, both relating to staff and patients about how we ensure that we um, don't have any inequalities in um, either the way that we protect our staff, knowing now which staff groups are more vulnerable, but also the way in which we deal with our patients, both those with COVID and those without. The guidance did signal um, a change in the financial regime. And when we met, last week to look at an updated plan as a board for um, submission. We didn't have those financial arrangements. We will get opportunity later to discuss them in more detail, but I think it's fair to say that in summary, they allow us to deliver our ambition as we've agreed it at the board in the rest of this year um, and give us the resource that we believe will mm. be necessary yeah. um, to do that. So. Um, I won't say any more about that just now. The timetable has slipped slightly um, on the back of the late notification of those new financial regimes. So we've got a return that needs to be um, submitted nationally from an ICP perspective on the 5th of October. And in the middle of October, we will be producing a planning return for the organisation. Um, we will be putting in place an extraordinary board to sign that up. That's right. If I move on to developments at the North Eastern Cumbria ICS level, there hasn't been a meeting um, of this um, group since the last board, but there was a, uh, a sort of event, a virtual event that was held and it looked at the developing governance that um, for the ICS and board members will recall that there's a requirement to have an independent chair of each ICS by the end of March. So just by way of quick update, there's an agreement that the ICPs will each put forward uh, lay members, non-execs or chairs to develop a process by which we would anticipate we would be able to secure that appointment um, at the end of March. So for us, that's the chair from um, Sunderland FT, it's a um, GP chair from Sunderland South Tyneside and from the local authority it's the chair of our health and wellbeing board so there's a mm. geographical uh, yeah. mix there. The meeting covered the promise to BAME staff that we've previously had reported at the board and that was supported by everybody and local authorities are looking at how they might link into that 
and it also gave an opportunity to showcase some of the really strong partnership working that had been in place during COVID, both between primary secondary care with colleagues in public health and the very valuable role that our public, um, sorry, that our voluntary sector played. Moving over to the um, page four in terms of local authority seven, um, board members will be familiar from briefings that we've provided that there are restrictions that were sought from the seven local authorities comprising County Durham, Sunderland, South Tyneside, Gateshead, Newcastle, North Tyneside and Northumberland in view of the increasing infections and indeed national restrictions have been brought in that come into place today um, further to those that are in the report. We provide services that cover the Darlington population too and at this point in time they are not subject to the restrictions that are specific to the local authority seven but in terms of the patients that come into Darlington and the staff that work in Darlington um, they come from across the county and given that we're on the borders we've applied the same um, arrangements in both DMH that we have in all of the other hospitals that we provide services from. In terms of the collaborative work between ourselves, South Tees and North Tees in the Southern ICP, we've developed and agreed a management compact, so that's in the pack for board to see, and we're in the middle of producing some ICS um, governance arrangements for all ICPs and um, we're reviewing currently a draft proposed operating um, model, operating system that the board will have opportunity to comment on. There was a clinical workshop that was planned for the 7th of September but that's been deferred to allow a little bit more time for clinicians to come up with the um, visions that they have for services across the next two to five years so that's now scheduled um, COVID allowing for the 16th of October and as I've referred to before the ICP has been overseeing the, the ICP plans that need to be submitted um, at system wide level up to the centre by the 5th of October. The central ICP has been uh, meeting periodically during COVID and really although it's been overseeing the um, recovery planning its main focus has been solely that and it hasn't progressed at this point mm. any of the um, clinical work streams. In terms of EPR, our EPR was paused by the board for 12 months so that we could uh, manage COVID without that um, potential diversion of our attention and there is an item that we'll be discussing later today about how we bring that back into um, time frame from the beginning of March that will be discussed at the meeting this afternoon. International recruitment of nurses, I'm sure Noel will talk a little bit more about that, that in his report, but just by way of update, um, we did have 20 um, nurses join us on the um, week of the 24th of October, and we are due another cohort of 20 that will arrive before the end of October, so that's really helpful, particularly when we go on to discuss the level of vacancies <coughs> that we have within the organisation. And then a real coup for us, um, our first Secretary of State visit for some time, our first Secretary of State visit we think ever to Shotley Bridge. Um, we have Matt Hancock visiting both Shotley Bridge, Bishop Auckland and Darlington Memorial Hospitals on the 14th of September. He was very impressed by the work that he saw, particularly the work that had been put in place very quickly to stand up services to deal with COVID um, and particularly the, uh, in relation to that work, the ED changes that have been made at DMH. I think it was helpful to have him um, visit. It's the first visit he'd met, he's made outside of London since COVID, um, the COVID pandemic began, and it gave us opportunity um, for both our staff to share with him what they've been doing and also for us to have um, private discussions about the ambitions that we have for the patch. And that's everything on the Okay, report. thank you, Sue. Just to add two observations. With regard to the Central ICP, there's going to be a meeting of the chairs next uh, on the 8th of October. It's a virtual meeting, so that will be useful. And secondly, it's a question really about recruitment. I read that uh, additional funding has been made available to help with recruitment. I just wonder how that will make its way down to help us. 
So the Secretary of State has announced £29 million pounds mm. of, of additional recruitment to support uh, both regional hubs, local initiatives to um, help new recruits, uh, perhaps through quarantine, as our Indian nurses have experienced, um, other pastoral um, issues, uh, as well as further funding to assist healthcare systems development. Mm. Um, there is a bidding process for that. I'm confident we will secure a six-figure sum. Mm -hmm. I write that down, Mr. Brown. Mm -hmm. um, on the basis of the criteria that have been handed down, but that bidding process was only announced last Thursday. Right. Thank you, Noel. If we can then move on to the Care Quality Commission update. Yes, the, the report this month really focuses on the reporting um, that CQCD called CQC Insights. Um, I think there's a few things that are important to note about this. First of all, as you'll um, acknowledge, some of the data sources are quite um, old in terms of it uses national published data sources to pull the report together. Um, <coughs> and it's also something that's to be used as a guide, so it's not intended that the um, report uh, does anything really other than prompt us to potentially look at areas of really good practice and areas of um, potential um, practice where our results aren't as strong as other organisations in England. So uh, I think that's important to note to begin with. Um, we have seen some, um, we, we last saw this report back in January and I think since then we've seen some improvements in some areas um, and um, some deterioration it's um, they're detailed on the face of the report I would say that um, the some of the deterioration that we've seen is linked directly to COVID and will have been seen across all organizations in the um, in England um, so particularly those linked to operational performance around first treatments to 62 day urgent cancer screenings, um, six week diagnostic tests and the referral to uh, treatment targets. They're all reviewed on a, the basis of this year compared to last and clearly the review period that's being selected um, for the report that you've got in front of you is July. So some of those deteriorations um, will be across the board. We only have access to our own data. On page three of the report are the headline trends. So um, that shows that really statistically um, there is overall no difference. Um, We've had the September report, which was produced um, at a point where it was too late to bring to the board, but we've had opportunity to review that at a high level, and um, certainly there's no significant changes in that. In terms of the indicators that um, are deteriorating to uh, worse or much worse in the data set um, since that, from December 2019, they're detailed on pages four and five of the report and um, what you'll see is the work that we're doing that the board will largely already be familiar with to make improvements in those particular areas and um, clearly as the report indicates there's some improvements that we've seen already so um, particularly in respect of MRS bacteremia. The, the same analysis is done in terms of those indicators where there is a slight um, deterioration and again the actions that we've taken are detailed there for you. The report then looks at the indicators um, of which there are 17 that are re ranked better or much better than other organisations across England. So I think really the report is here to provide a level of assurance to the board about the work that we're doing where national indicators are identifying that um, we have performance that we could potentially improve and to also identify those areas um, where we've made improvements over previous months and are performing significantly better than other organisations. I'm Thank happy you, to sir. take any questions. Yeah. Simon? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, just one for clarity. On page eight, the, the last four indicators, and it, and it does say that the following indicators are, are from a survey in 2018. Yeah. 
where it's got worse, is that just the indicator got worse at that time and it just holds that position until some updated? Because we know the work that's been going on and we know the improvements, but I'm just wondering how they how they, they identified as worse and not the same as. Yes, yeah, so these are from national surveys, they are typically annually and these are indicators that are worse or much worse and usually <coughs> they tend to use about a 20% cut off. I'd have to confirm for these specific ones um, exactly where they are but clearly we've already had um, staff surveys for 2019 so the data is quite old in terms of some of the published um, Figures. So we've seen particular improvements in each of those areas. Um, we also talk in a report later about um, you know, staff engagement and the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian where we've been the most improved trust in the country. So it's really the health warnings that are in the beginning of the report that we need to be cognizant of because some of the data is quite historic in nature. That said, because CQC use it as a set of indicators that prompt a discussion that they have with us in the relationship meetings, I think it's important that the board um, it, it's shared with the board. Clearly members of the board will, will also know that what we're doing is we're developing our own system so that we will have a more comprehensive way to bring and um, consolidate the indicators of clinical quality to you to both support the care groups in the work that they're doing to improve services but also to allow um, the board, to allow IQAC, to allow individual directors to drill down more um, readily than, than currently is the case into the quality of services at both trust and down to specialty level. So I think that as time goes on, as, as that system is introduced in autumn of this year, that will provide a valuable and pr certainly more up-to-date um, analysis for the board. But the, I think the value of this one is it gives you that comparative picture. Under the new regimes soon, uh, of inspection, how, um, how, how much are they going to rely on this sort of information? I think it's unclear. So CQC have advised that they're going to revise their inspection regime. They're sort of taking soundings and consulting on it now. And the view is that there'll be less um, mass visits to sites and um, we've got, I think Warren's putting his hand up, Warren and Emma have been involved in those um, discussions nationally. So I think what we're likely to see is uh, a, perhaps an increased focus on data sources and perhaps um, less um, mass visits to look at comprehensive reviews of trusts but still a focus on risk-based um, interventions with organisations. And if you want to add, Warren. Yeah, so in relation to um, how they would um, look to use intelligence to drive their, their questions for, for risk focus inspections, which is where they're going, they recognise that this insights tool is blunt and suffers from the limitations that Sue's outlined. Um, so they, they, have indi they have indicated in the early consultation discussions that they're looking to refine and improve the tool. But they're also acknowledging that the tool is brought in some of the limitations. So uh, essentially, what it will prompt is a dialogue with the provider to say, what are their explanations for these trends? What do your own information systems say? Can you share your own information and evidence with us so that they get a proper understanding before they then uh, make any assumptions in terms of key lines of inquiry and uh, looking into it? So, they will continue to use it, but that they recognise that it needs to be used in a very careful and intelligent way. And just to pick up Simon's question, um, the worst for those indicators is worse than peers. And it is, it, it is broadly, as Sue said, at the sort of 20% um, type measure. Um, in the September report, those bottom three that we've indicated could we have now, we're talking <coughs> about the same based on the 2019 survey results. Uh, I think just to be absolutely clear, because it's a point of interpretation, I, I agree with Sue in terms of what's in the September report doesn't include anything significant, as it doesn't tell us anything we don't already know and aren't already investigating. <coughs> but because of the way Insights has a timeline on it compared to some of our own reporting to board, it does show a bump up around Shimmy, which we previously reported in the back. Uh, for it going outside of the limit and it's now just come back with the limit and inside.
science will catch up with that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Michael. Thank you, Jeff. Um, just referring to the mortality issue on page five. <coughs> excuse me. We've received assurance reports at Iquac about um, the, the work that's going on in this area. It's going to find that those two work streams are now in place. We could we just have an update on the IT time scales? Because I'm sure you agree that the quicker we have this community, the better. Mm. So, so we've had um, we've commissioned an extra piece of work. So we've had a. a um, a number of pieces of work that have been done independently of those of us that have given us assurance around those indicators but what we've asked for is a detailed kind of case review of all of the um, deaths where it would appear the chance of death was less than 10 percent um, and that's so that rather than looking um, at a high level we're going into in all the individual cases um, which will um, prove or otherwise the point around coding. So that work's begun, hasn't yes. it, Jeremy? It has and circa 100 cases. Yeah, should be complete before Christmas. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and if anything, in, in as it's carried out, l sort of leads to anything other than the coding issue that we think we have, obviously we'd alert, um, we'd be alerted in advance of that, but the full set of cases uh, for review should be completed by Christmas. Thank you for that. I'm pleased the matter of coding has been picked up because I know Jeremy referred to that at a previous meeting, so that's been followed up. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not, I've just got one for you, Noel. It's on page five, and it's in relation to uh, it says band seven midwives uh, are driving midwives' presence in rooms. Could you just expand on that a little bit? Band seven midwives. midwives. Uh, are driving midwives' presence in rooms and challenging midwives that are n not with women. It's one of the indicators that's uh, about the same. It's on page five. Well, I can. Well, I think it's the action yeah, um, yeah, it's that's being taken. Yeah, it's not. It's not terribly clear, is it? Um, clearly, we're engaged in a program called the Continuity of Care. Mm. We have uh, assigned a dedicated team to try and improve continuity of um, care, particularly mm. amongst at risk women. Mm. So, um, young mothers, those from economically divided backgrounds, those that have got um, difficult family environments, mm. uh, and as a consequence, that program is um, in its nascent stage. Uh, and my only assumption is that we have managed to uh, uh, complete any returns. But but it doesn't read that potential mothers are being left on their own. No, I don't believe so. No, um, um, so yeah. the Trinity services are, are well staffed. Um, and we receive safe staff and returns here, which we monitor very carefully. Uh, where, where we do have peaks and troughs and activities you would mm. expect in any labour board there are yeah. contingency plans to ensure that women are properly supported and the feedback we get from them directly is universally positive. Okay. That's great, thank you. Dad. Any other questions on this paper? If not, then we'll move on to board assurance framework. So I think Mr Edge is going to take this paper. I think the only um the only bit I would add is on sustainability, we have reconstituted um, the group that was suspended during COVID. Warren refers to it on page three. And we expect to bring to board some ambitions both for ultimate <coughs> net carbon neutral. Um, and we're debating the time frame for that um, at our meeting on Thursday. And we have some really um, interesting and ambitious goals for um, the rest of this year running into next year which we hope the board will support um, they cover a number of different initiatives from um, saving a million miles a month in travel through to looking at the way we use um, single use plastics so um, that will be a topic that will um, come to board in October Thank you. So the report provides the usual helicopter view of the level of assurance available in respect of the 18 principal business objectives that are included within the assurance framework. 
um, five of those which we added in July uh, relating specifically to um, the impact of COVID-19, the remainder um, the more business as usual activities that we interpreted in the current environment. It also um, shows you the overall risk profile, uh, risk score and, and position against the um, target risk management trajectory that the board has agreed for each of those objectives and um, includes a full exposition of all this of the board's risk tolerance risk tolerances uh, in the uh, in the final section. The uh, scores uh, and the outcomes and overall position in terms of each objective have been discussed individually with executive directors, confirmed by executive directors as a group. Uh, the rationale and the detail for that, there is a, a document to, to support that in the private section of the meeting because of some issues of commercial sensitivity. Uh, but the process followed was, as we have outlined to the board previously, so we have our risk assessment matrix, which is based upon the old National Patient and Safety Agency matrix and regarded as good practice. We uh, propose scores um, tied to the metrics and uh, indicators within that matrix. Uh, we considered the underlying operational risk, bearing in mind that our policy is to take a holistic view for each objective and not to score based on the lowest common denominator, uh, specific risks and specific areas, uh, because that provides a distorted view of the progress that's been, been made overall and, and the overall level of risk. So that process was followed, consideration given to those factors to result in the, in the risk scores, current risk scores that you see within the document. Um, IQAC has also reviewed all of the objectives within the agreement and was satisfied with the presentation of assurance outcomes uh, and the view of risk set out within the document. Um, there are positive assurance outcomes within the period which are summarised on the second page of the cover sheet and which I won't list in detail. Um, all of the risks Sorry, all of the objectives are tracking against their agreed risk management trajectories. Um, ten of them are on target, eight of them aren't at target yet, um, and the actions required to bring them onto target are set out on page five of the report in detail so that we can understand the further work um, that is taking place uh, to bring them in line uh, to their targets with the risk management trajectories. Uh, that the board has previously said. There's only one area rated red, which is the very well rehearsed area at these meetings in relation to restart capacity and our ability to uh, achieve the levels of activity that we would in an ideal world wish to achieve given all the infection control um, and social distancing constraints within which we're having to operate. Clearly, um, since this report was written, um, Sue's already indicated we've seen uh, increases in uh, admissions in relation to COVID-19 cases, and we do suspect that we are at the beginning of a second spike. Um, and so that's something that exec directors are keeping a very close eye on in terms of how it will impact the, the uh, back. Uh, in the discussion last week, we highlighted that there are clearly potential impacts on objectives such as staff health and well-being, you know, global pressure that comes along, uh, restart capacity, and, and a number of others. Um, so, um, I think in terms of the operational risks, um, I won't go through those in detail. But what I would say is um, they are mapped within the tables for each objective to those objectives, so you can see. Uh, where there are risks outside of tolerance for each objective and, and where some of those individual risks may be higher than the overall objective score. Uh, that gives you as a board full transparency uh, on the data for every single objective and the ability to challenge them without having to take any questions. Any questions? Michael. Oh yeah, Michael. It's not so much a question, but it's a query. <coughs> Uh, page 114, which is the um, minimising avoided, avoidable patient deaths from non COVID, does the commentary at the foot of the page need amending to bring it in line with the assurance outcomes of possible, given that Shimmy has now come below the upper limit? Yes, yes, that's been um, 
be missed, so it should say it's just within the limit. Just got a few, uh, well, it's. Uh, questions or observations around the operational risks, uh, Warren, and the first one, 2338, it's good to see that's been followed up and that Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir are now following up on the children with eating disorders. But they will be our patients referred to that service. And we know nationally there's a huge backlog of people waiting for CAMS assessment and that. So will we still be keeping a monitor on how our patients are being progressed or not? Yes, we will. I think the uh, specific dimensions to this risk um, that is important in terms of the, the introduction of the Cumbria and Northumbria Town and Way services that our community services um, dietitians in particular were, were concerned that they would need to, in the absence of that service, mm. skill up um, to essentially. Um, Step, um, to address the deficit um, of, of, of that mental health support with it not being locally available um, and um, seek, would seek to develop a more multidisciplinary <coughs> approach. Mm -hmm. They no longer need to do that given mm -hmm. that they've now, uh, through the company, not only Tang and Weir service, uh, got the ability to re regain that input. Mm -hmm. But it's still very much on their, their radar in terms of the, the complexity uh, of some of these cases and the backlogs that you talked about. So. Uh, the risk um, will reduce but won't disappear of the risk register and, and the monitoring will continue. Oh, that's good. good. Got another observation about 2116, which refers to laboratory assisted conception unit of Bishop Auckland, and that's to do with staffing. But will there be any implications for patients? I think the, um, the service is being sustained. But yeah. the, the risk is to, to the, the sustainability of it, um, and it, it can result in some short-term disruption to patients when um, the small team um, that are involved with that unit um, suffer sickness absence, for example. Um, and it's not an issue that is specific to the trust; it's a challenge for others in the region. Hence, there has been an attempt to find a regional solution, but hasn't yet yielded benefit. Um, the, there are also some impacts in terms of um, reporting processes and reporting delays and it tends to be uh, that patients come first and the, the reporting um, into regional systems more widely gets delayed whenever that situation arises. Mm -hmm. So the, the critical thing is, is, is the paper that's been brought forward to executive directors to see to expand the staff. Okay, thank you Arnold. And finally, and I know what, uh, Noel has responded to this on many occasions, it's 2060, it's about insufficient paediatric staff in ED, and you know, the hours have been extended, so again, Noel, uh, I know we've been successful in recruiting additional paediatric nurses recently. We have, and we went at uh, a little risk to recruit every paediatric graduate that was available to us. Um, as a consequence, uh, the paediatric staffing has stopped to speak for some time. Uh, and the care group bringing forward papers to look, look at how we could sustain effectively 12 hour and uh, potentially 24 hour cover in pediatric emergency departments in combination with their front and face functions in the inpatient wards. Mm. So we're monitoring that quite closely. Um, it is an encouraging and improving picture. Um, but nevertheless, we are at risk of um, being close to our own retirement so far as the service that has been expanded and been very popular with patients. It has suffered some interruption during COVID-19. We want to restore it to full capacity uh, and then try to progress to make it uh, more resilient in the areas of darkness. I think the, the other thing is the physical yeah. build at DMH is um, due to be start before Christmas and that will facilitate a front of house service in DMH similar to the That's popular right. one that Noel's just referred yeah. to mm. at Durham so that will mm. help in terms of bringing all the paediatric staff within yeah. um, front of house together. Yeah, That's good. Okay. Uh, Jenny? Uh, it's just the patient experience um, on both the uh, Covid one and the main objectives. So I mentioned people like Health Watch and just some of the wandering community sectors that deal with uh, patients. And with respect, the OSC and um, the Health and Wellbeing Board are a little bit distant from the actual patient's experience. They may get some abuse from their patients. 
And how do we get down to the patient themselves? I think the role of Health Watch and OSC has been so compromised during the uh, pandemic. Clearly, they are heavily restricted from entering the hospital. Uh, we have got uh, very severe visiting restrictions in place currently, and that will apply to their work also. So they do rely upon us for remote monitoring. We have instituted COVID-19 uh, perfect ward monitoring, which monitors both the patient's experience and the staff experience, and we've also instituted a perfect ward, the general uh, uh, nursing indicator tool that is showing month on month improvements in both the quality of the patient's experience and compliance with the monitoring tool. So I'm, I recognise that there is an issue. Uh, obviously, the with, the with the kind offices of charitable funds, we have managed to distribute large numbers of iPads to patients. So uh, they're not quite as isolated as they might be, yeah. um, and, and and that's something that we're very very. I think it's just more how do we get those patient stories because we've struggled at IQAC to get a patient story help with Michael and uh, we think it might help us just because sometimes they don't want to make a complaint they don't want to talk but if they start to talk to you about their experience you actually realize some things are right some things are wrong we can get a better feel of what we're doing I know that's difficult at the minute but are there plans to start to improve that for health watch obviously have their feet on the ground um, I think it, 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 just overnight we received a, a compliment from a, a very positive yeah. uh, relative of, of a, a young person who anticipated a very difficult hospital experience and, and actually found it, it to be the contrary. And I'm sure we can capture more testimonials like that, which are voluntarily coming forward from members of the public. And that might give a flavour of the patient's experience. As you say, the difficulty is very often mm -hmm. that. Um, Patients uh, are reluctant to say anything on, on camera uh, or in, in writing, particularly in front of the meeting. Um, and indeed, uh, short audio diaries is also uh, not, not well taken up. But where they voluntarily write to us, we can certainly write back and ask if yeah. they'd be kind enough to allow us to use those as excerpts. I think our patient engagement strategy now we've got the, for the first time also does elicit ways in which the board will get and I quite get a richer, more comprehensive picture about experience pulling together the strands of both those individual stories, the national surveys that we have, local surveys that we run, the friends and family tests. So I think as we see that roll out for the first time during the course of this year, that hopefully both to IQAC, to the board and to other meetings within the trust gives us a, a vein to tap into that we probably haven't had um, as coherently as um, before the strategy was yeah. developed. Mm -hmm. And that includes Health Watch. Simon? Yeah, just one and just on, on COVID again, and it does say there's some short-term mitigation uh, of the risk in place anyway, but uh, and it, it's the executive directors have asked for the UHND uh, acute respiratory unit and the additional side rooms to be expedited. Have we got any ideas on timescales for that? Yes, we have. Yes, yes, yes we have. The, 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 <laughs> the issue there was that um, with um, the, uh, the, um, the processes that are usually around where APFI is concerned, that we were looking at um, the possibility of really quite elongated um, timescales for the work to be completed. Um, I'm pleased to be able to um, report that um, through the kind offices of um, Alison's um, team, um, a, a very good um, solution has been worked up so that the works will be able to start immediately after the previous enabling works have been completed. So we would be looking um, at um, the, um, the end of December into, the, into January as, um, as the earliest that it could be done and indeed um, the team have been able to, um, to bring it in to coincide with that. Thank you. Any other? Michael? Just one last one, Joe. On <coughs> page one, two, three, there's a reference to the board development programme that has been paused during the COVID 19 pandemic and the need for it to be refreshed. I just wondered if we have any plans for that given the weight that CQC usually attached to board development when looking at well less. <coughs> I think the short answer is. Yes, in the sense that it's something that I, I know I need with Morgan's help to do. 
Uh, but um, in terms of the shape of it and any detail, not at this stage, it's something that we'll bring back in October. Any other questions from Board Assurance? No? If not, then we'll move on to the uh, Executive Director's Report on COVID-19 Management, Performance, Finance and Reset Programme. Thank you. So, um, as we've mentioned a couple of times this morning already, since this report was written, we've seen an increase in the amount of um, COVID patients that we've got. So, at the time of writing, um, which referred to the 21st of September, we had eight um, COVID positive patients. As of this morning, we've got 31 confirmed and we've got 72 where were pending receiving the results. So I think we've seen a significant increase. It's matched the increase of neighbouring organisations, albeit we've been a little bit um, behind them in seeing um, the, the numbers increase. As a result, we've put in place some strengthened arrangements. So under command and control, we're still in a major incident. We're still running with gold command twice a week, directors meeting three times a week. But we've put in place a lad B um, to look at the emergency response across agencies. So that's now running three days a week. Um, obviously, myself and yourself, Chairman, are yeah. speaking each day over seven days. And um, in terms of Steve and his lead, in terms of resilience, we've agreed that we'll um, put that back up to weekly meetings from um, essentially two meetings a month. There's also more activity um, that we're involved with. So the strategic command group has been stood back up. So that's looking again at multi-agency response across County Durham and Darlington, which matches the local resilience forum patch and the strategic recovery group, which was looking at how we um, essentially got back to normal has been essentially paused. It tends to be the, between the SRG and the SCG the same membership so there's a heightened um, level of grip control understanding and uh, agencies working together in the face of what we do think is the beginning of a second um, spike the just on that so uh, yeah. you made reference mm -hmm. to lag b it's a it's an open meeting and some people may not know what lag b stands for and who's engaged with it yeah. And in the current climate, it would be just nice to emphasise that again. Yeah, so it's the local area delivery board, and that includes colleagues from CCGs, from local authorities, and from different partners, <coughs> excuse me, across health. And our job is to ensure that we can safely respond to urgent patient need, whether that's presenting in acute services, such as the ones we run, whether it's presenting in mental health services, or whether it's presenting into the care and nursing home sector. So we have collective responsibility for ensuring that we optimise that. So um, That's great. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. So moving on, we've, we've referred to some of the items um, in here, but there's a couple of things I'd pick out in terms of quality and safety indicators. So we do have very good and comprehensive ability to look at our performance through the electronic means that we've reported before, and we continue to report really good compliance. I think the um, there are a couple of things that are beginning to challenge us. So. Um, the report refers to a um, situation on one particular ward where we have um, two patients with COVID. We test every patient that comes in for COVID and we then test patients at five to seven days and before discharge in certain arrangements. Um, we've done a lot of work on mm -hmm. preventing any uh, nosocomial infection, but I think as the numbers increase, and more COVID patients are going through, it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that all of those um, systems are working as well as is possible. We don't essentially, um, we're not able to look at the strain, so it's hard sometimes with um, visiting, etc., to know where um, COVID risk has been introduced, but Noel has a team that look at each specific case so that we can um, learn and draw any lessons that we need to 
um, in terms of any COVID spread within the hospital setting. And I think um, further to this report being written, there's been a number of um, a small number of further cases um, that have um, come up within the hospital setting. In terms of our staff, I think equally we now have a situation where we're better able to monitor. We've got um, track and trace now in place in terms of the app that was launched at the weekend and we have got some examples where um, we need to reinforce the ar arrangements that we've put in for staff to ensure that they keep themselves safe, um, socially distanced at all points and um, wear correct PPE um, when that is indicated. We have no shortages of PPE, um, we're spending a lot of time um, emphasising all of the um, requirements, Noel and Jeremy particularly are spearheading the, the campaign that we've got with our clinical staff to ensure that we keep all of our patients safe and indeed our staff. In terms of capacity, again we touched on this earlier but we with the increased numbers of COVID patients need to ensure that we optimise the use of side rooms that we um, are able to continue to undertake safely as much elective activity as possible and certainly some of the measures and um, changes that we introduced in the first wave will help us do that but inevitably with some of the figures that we're starting to see there will be a knock-on to the elective programme that the board has um, agreed which essentially assumes no Covid spike and that is the same for each um, and every organisation. If I move on to testing, um, there's details in the report about the numbers of staff that we test um, and that those tests are for both COVID and for um, the antibody test. We are due to get this month four machines that will help us get test results back more quickly and they're going to be essential to help us be able to define for each patient that's admitted whether they have COVID infection or not and then um, put them quickly into the most suitable accommodation. Those machines haven't yet arrived. Um, we are expecting them to come um, and they will enable us to test um, more frequently some but not all of our daily emergency admissions which can um, amount to very easily more than 70 patients a day. We, we are bidding um, nationally for a machine that will allow us to do higher volume tests because the problem we have at the minute of about 300 tests a day we're having to send about half of them out of the organisation and clearly that increases the turnaround time which then makes it more difficult for us to optimise the patient pathways within the hospitals so I think it's going to be quite pivotal whether we are able to secure access to that high volume machine and whether the um, quick 90 minute tests do come in they will significantly help our efforts and are something that wasn't available to us back in March and April. In terms of the um, workplace safety and agile working again we've touched on it earlier in the meeting we've put significant arrangements in place that allow people to work flexibly we have covid secure arrangements on our sites with very strict and stringent rules we've also enabled um, 700 staff to to be able to work safely from home with the technology that they need clearly government advice has um, changed regarding that it's not possible for all staff within our setting to work from home because some of them need access to um, information and um, contacts that they can only have in the workplace setting but where people can work safely at home where it still allows us to provide the service um, we do facilitate that working. In terms of our assurance and risk log as Warren has said um, we continue to have the additional objectives in the BAF in terms of our risk register, we review that through Gold weekly and we are, as Warren identified, on heightened um, alert given the, the increase is that we've seen um, 
and will continue to manage risk on a daily basis. The increase in COVID is also impacting on our care homes, both in terms of the staff that they have at their disposal, some of whom are testing positive for COVID, and in terms of their residents. So we continue to support care and nursing homes by providing tests to symptomatic patients in those homes. That's carried out by our community teams. And in Extremis, we support um, those um, care homes if they um, have staffing issues. I have to stress that that is in extremis and we're working with local authorities to put in place arrangements that would um, kick in on a more substantive basis earlier on. Carol will later on um, take us through the performance against our constitutional targets but as you will note they continue to be compromised um, by the arrangements we've had to put in place for COVID. I think on a more positive note, when we look at our performance compared to colleagues across the North East and North Cumbria, however, um, our performance is um, pretty solid. So um, we're all being impacted on very similarly. Um, are we trying to book COVID patients into the acute hospitals only, or are we moving them around the stage? Um, they're not in the acute hospitals only, but they are in the places where they are. Um, es essentially, we've got some principles um, that we um, apply to how we're running the services and infection prevention control is at the top of those principles. So patients may move out of acute hospitals, but we minimise the risk of any um, spread on an individual basis. So they'll tend to present into the acute hospitals that's where they'll sort of first come into our services through the um either the a e department or referrals from gps um, in terms of finance we have had an arrangement in place for the first half of this year which has essentially seen us be paid for the cost that we've incurred um, for COVID. The arrangement, as I referred to earlier, does change in the second half of the year. We didn't have it available at the time the papers were written, but we do believe we can run our services um, in the second half of the year and deliver essentially a break-even position. In terms of research, you've had a number of updates um, to you in terms of the way we're intending to deliver services moving forward that links to the um, capacity and the um, level of performance that we've previously advised and signed off with you last um, Monday. As I say, this um, those levels of performance don't take into account a second COVID spike and we're working um, on a, a return today that will look at how we think they will be impacted in three different circumstances, um, each of which identifies a different level of COVID activity. So we'll be able to share those with you before our return goes up in the middle of October. Okay, thank you, thank Sue. You. Any questions for Sue? Yeah, Steve? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sue. Just a couple of um, questions really on the uh, air hole situation. You mentioned that uh, tests were being conducted uh, for care homes. I just wondered what the sort of demand versus supply was. Are you, are you sort of getting a lot more demand that you, that you can't meet or is, is supply meeting demand in that regard? So at the minute we have um, really supply is meeting demand. Whether with um, track and trace, we, we've got, because we're an area that's under additional restrictions, we have got some mobile units that were um, staff in care homes are able to access. So we've got increased testing capacity within the patch. Um, so I don't think from a um, staffing perspective that care homes will have any problems in getting their staff tested because of that additional resource. Okay. And the second point was, in 3.9 you mentioned Yes, and we've been doing that for some time. So we have about 90 care homes and nursing homes that we work with across our patch. 
And just to give you um, an indication, two of them are having some difficulties around staffing at the minute. Most of the care homes have quite a lot of additional capacity um, because in the first wave of COVID, there was a, a lessening of um, patients being referred into care homes. I suspect families were wanting to keep their loved ones at home. And so there is physical capacity in the care homes, but two are reporting some difficulties around staffing. Okay, thanks, Steve. Anybody else? If not, then we'll move on to integrated performance report, Carol. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, if, um, if, if I start and, um, and cover my areas of responsibility and then hand over to my colleagues um, to draw out their key points and the order that they're listed on the front sheet of the report. So, in respect of constitutional targets, the key points that I would raise are that our overall weight in this position is, um, is starting to increase again and although we are still not back at the level that we were at the beginning of this year. The reason for that, um, that increase in, um, in waiting list um, following the dip that we saw during the summer relates entirely to the fact that we are now doing more outpatient appointments, which um, the board will know was paused during the, um, the, the height of the first wave of the pandemic. So as more outpatients are, are seen, then clearly more patients are added to the waiting list. And that's the reason for, um, for the rise there. Um, but again, I would, um, I would emphasize not back to the level that we were seeing at um, the beginning of this year. Again, on the overall waiting list um, position, what we are seeing is that the referral to treatment times, which, um, as, um, as you will remember, decreased during the, uh, the, the middle of the pandemic and went as low as um, 36% um, at, um, at the July position. And what we are seeing there is we're seeing a slow improvement in that position. And that again relates to the number of patients that are being seen, that um, as we are gradually seeing more patients, then our RTT will, will increase. But as I've said to the board um, on previous occasions, what has happened is that the shape of the waiting list curve has changed. Um, which means that we have a lot of people who are now, as the, as the curve has moved over to the right on the, the axis, we have people who are um, constantly tipping into the over the 18 week um, position. And as those patients are, are work through the system, then we can expect the RTT position to be depressed for some time to, um, uh, to come. In relation to the AME performance, um, then again we saw a, um, a, a step change in performance for the better against the four hour target during the height of the, the wave of pandemic. And this was largely related to, to three things. That was a, um, a massive reduction in the number of attendances. Um, the second was um, the efforts that we had gone to to increase bed capacity across the organisation and that we always had uh, beds. And thirdly, um, the impact of having um, a double a &E department on both of our sites meant that we had massive flow, uh, a massive improvement in flow through our a &E departments which then um, resulted in an improved um, performance in the AD department. As we have um, stepped up our elective activity, we haven't had as many beds available. Um, as the wave one has subsided and um, the, um, the message that the NHS is open for business as usual has um, gone out, then we have seen the number of attendances in our a &E department increase. And then thirdly, we have um, reduced our ED department down to 
um, on stream on both sites, and all of the additional staff that were redeployed to help at the front of house have now gone back to their um, usual areas of work as the um, as as all of our services have gradually been stood up. Um, there is a fourth issue though that is impacting, and um, Sue has just mentioned it in her report, and that is in relation to the um, swabbing and testing. Clearly we are experiencing delays in turnaround times, which means that patients are then being delayed in our ED departments for longer than we would like, and clearly um, once we can get access to the rapid turnaround tests um, and the additional equipment that Sue has talked about, then we would expect to be able to, that that, that factor would um, decline in terms of its um, impact on our four-hour performance. On diagnostics, um, as, um, as you know, we, um, uh, we stood down our routine diagnostics and maintained urgent and emergency throughout the wave one, which then has um, meant that we have built up a backlog that is particularly in relation to endoscopy. Um, we, we do not have um, another backlog in anything to do with radiology. Our main, our predominant problem is in relation to endoscopy. And, um, and so what you, you see in the report is that um, our performance, we will always be a solid, sound, good performer on diagnostics. Um, and um, but we saw our performance dip from um, going, going very low um, at, um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. What we have seen though, as a result of um, additional initiatives that have been put in by the staff as we, as we have stepped up the elective programme, and what you will see there is a gradual improvement of the position, which is particularly welcome because it is the endoscopy pathway in particular that is really important for our um, cancer diagnosis and our cancer performance. So it is particularly pleasing to see that our, um, our diagnostic performance is, um, is, is improving. And indeed, as an executive, we um, approved additional measures only um, at the end of last week um, to take effect from the end of October onwards, which um, we would anticipate um, uh, further improving the position and, and hopefully getting us uh, back to that sound performance that we have always uh, done and had a reputation for doing. And then um, my, my final points then are in relation to cancer, which I've already um, made reference to. Um, and again, throughout the wave one, we were particularly keen to um, keep our urgent and emergency and cancer um, uh, services um, going through that, and indeed did manage to, to do that, and so have therefore held, held a strong position. So whilst not, um, not quite meeting the, um, the constitutional standard, um, we nevertheless have, have maintained a strong performance um, and, um, and linked to the endoscopy, I would expect us to be able to, um, to improve that performance um, further. That of course is all set against the backdrop of um, a potential spike in wave two, in which case um, there could be further impact in terms of everything that I've just said, um, said there. And indeed, Sue has already made reference earlier on to our phase three plans, um, which would see the, that improvement and are the means by which we would see that improvement. But again, that is all dependent on what happens with wave two. And I would pause there before I hand, um, hand over to, um, to Noel for the you know, staffing um, elements of the, the report and take any questions or any comments from board members. Chair. Well, thanks, Carol. Just on handover delays becoming a bit of a problem again. Um, yes, <coughs> and, that, and that is entirely down hmm. to the busyness of the, yeah. um, of the department for the reasons that I have said. That's right. And also, clearly, what, um, the, the other point that I would add into that 
is the um, the need for social distancing mm. and um, and infection prevention and control measures does cause constraints in terms of the number of people that we can have right. in the waiting areas and within the department mm. at any particular um, moment in time, which automatically does mean that the pressure then yeah. is there to um, to to be um, holding off on the handover mm. it, until it is safe to do so. Whilst of course taking absolutely taking into account the clinical condition of yeah. the um, um, of patients um, concerned. Great, thank you, Carol. Any other questions for Carol at this stage? Um, Jeremy mentioned at the last meeting, sorry, Chair. Yeah, sorry, Jenny, yeah. Uh, Jeremy mentioned at the last meeting that he thought maybe we could push things through a bit quicker by different procedures. You were having to do a clinic. It was an uh, endoscopy okay. clinic, outpatients, outpatients yes, yeah. and so that is uh, being worked through by Rear's Rear Willoughby's Outpatients right. Group, uh, and we're constantly monitoring and changing and adapting what we do to get the biggest uh, throughput that we can. It's difficult to say what specific things because it is such a changing environment. Okay. If nothing else. Okay. So hand up to um, to Noel. Thank you very much, Carol. So the um, so staff report comprises a return based upon the month of August. As you can see, notwithstanding hotspot areas in wards 43, 51, uh, 62, and critical care in part due to lower utilization in respiratory and gynecology and critical care. Um, uh, overall, the staff levels have been upheld very well. Now, on page 10, you can see that there are also um, uh, difficulties staffing with sufficient registered nurses uh, at Sedgefield and Richardson uh, and at AMU in Durham, uh, as well as Ward 6, uh, 15 and 17 in surgery. Now, I think what's important to point out is that our staffing arrangements have been in, in a state of flux for a number of months. We've redeployed large numbers of staff up to 500 in order to take account of um, the needs to maintain services and expand bed capacity during COVID-19. Most of those staff have been repatriated. The distorting picture, however, is that staffing levels have been supplemented by uh, second and third year student nurses who have been remunerated at bands three and four. Uh, they exceed budget for which we already have an income from health education England. Mm -hmm. So the presence of 100 students on the healthcare system pay line, which is cost neutral to us, um, makes uh, interpreting this rather difficult. Um, as you can see, um, the sisters have provided uh, an account as, as to why there are gaps, and in particular, uh, the vacancy levels are significant. You have um, seen an account from a labor ward of how they're monitoring um, midwifery staff levels. Um, peaks and troughs are being adequately compensated for, as you can see from the report, but it is under constant review. But as you can see, planned against actual shows a significant spike in, in July, uh, dissipating slightly in August, and that will disappear completely uh, in September. The vacancy numbers um, are also uh, somewhat misleading. Um, the number that was reported for RN vacancies uh, for the month of July we now believe to be incorrect, partly because of double counting, i.e. the student nurses are on the healthcare system pay line and appear as of overstaffing there. The same people, thankfully, are um, on the pending RN appointment fill line, so um, the same people appear twice in the report. Um, it's pleasing to note that 56 registered nurses took up post new graduates on Monday last, and that's out of the 75 that were offered positions. Uh, a number of those uh, uh, taken has been delayed because of failure to complete occupational health checks or provide academic references um, or uh, failure to uh, uh, complete their required practice hours for completion of their program, which is somewhat calling given that. For many of them, they've been on full salary and working full time for the last four and a half months. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I assume that we are uh, trying to troubleshoot, and hopefully, a number more of those will come on stream. And indeed, they are not just from Teesside University, but from uh, Sheffield, Manchester, Leeds, and Northumbria, which is very pleasing. So, um, overall, the staffing picture will stabilise, um, but as you've already heard, the impact of COVID 19 will be significant. 
the current number of vacancies in the several hundred is likely to expand uh, given um, the need to bring uh, additional escalation awards on stream while at the same time our room for manoeuvre around redeploying staff from elective and the ambulatory programs into the front line will be constrained by a desire to maintain those as for as long as possible. And so we will need to be, uh, I think nimble was the word that was used earlier, uh, and how we deploy our workforce. And uh, uh, that's something we keep under constant review. Uh, I'd like to take any questions on our uh, safe staffing position. No. Any questions for Noel? Sorry, Chair, could I just make yeah, an additional yeah. amendment to, to those figures as Noel well yeah. identifies um, the, in the page, I've got page 162, it references actual vacancy between physicians which are contracted, which is 14177. That is actually the difference between our contracted hours and actual work, so just for accuracy, that obviously is a different bit, so we just make that amendment. And then just for completeness, last month's um, actual figure, we did all, I suppose, note 0.65 RM vacancies was, uh, was a, a very uh, pleasant place to be, if it were, or has in fact been accurate, and we did say there would be a review of that. It should be 73.51. Okay. Thank you, Norma. Yeah, Michael? Just a question on detail on, on 143. <coughs> Um, sisters comment on page 157 on VBR, page 11 of the report. Um, it says that four staff on the service is in nine vacancies. So a gap of 13, that seems very, very big. Gap. What's the strategy for coping with that? Um, well, um, as you've heard, uh, we have been fortunate in securing graduates from uh, at least four universities in order to address the RN shortfall. 20 Indian nurses came on staff on the 24th of August, um, came out of quarantine two weeks later, uh, and then are on the, on the floor. Uh, they will complete their OSCE, which is the uh, pre-registration exam at the NMC Testing Centre in Northern Ireland next month. A further 20 will arrive on the 24th of October, uh, and I'll be bringing um, a, a request to bring a further 20 in November to Gold tomorrow. There are another 40 uh, within the contract that we can call off. Should we need to, uh, I think that's highly likely, we would need to uh, uh, justify that position. Uh, and for their 65 uh, pending graduates will be interviewed uh, later this week for January commencement. That being said, in addition, um, Morgan's team is working very hard on local recruitment initiatives to try to expand our profile and improve our attractiveness as a, as a place to work. Um, that will address lots of areas, including the ones that you've mentioned, but notably orthopedics, endoscopy, primary <coughs> theatres, and healthy medicine. Uh, and of course, we want to try to raise the profile uh, and uh, improve the uh, uptake of nursing uh, uh, recruitment at the Shibuya Hospital, which we will need to rely upon much more. Months. There is some refurbishment work currently taking place on Ward 7 and 10, and uh, we expect LD Medicine to begin to park quite centralised to that location uh, in coming weeks. So that Bishop Auckland, as, as a hospital, uh, will have a much more substantial footprint, and we believe that that will be much more attractive to support to develop the career. Okay. Thank you. So, acknowledging that things are changing by the day, and all our staffing levels are safe at this moment in time. We are safe at this moment in time, as, mm. I, as I've said. Um, mm. It is a juggling act, mm. um, trying Absolutely. to uh, bring in new recruits, mm. and manage our workforce flexibly, um, try to maintain uh, yeah. capacity for mm. uh, diagnostics, mm. for uh, urgent operations, yeah. for urgent outpatient appointments, and maintain the front line when, mm. as you've heard from yeah. Sue, uh, COVID activity is increasing both in general wards, community hospitals, and our critical care settings. Okay. Thank you, Noel. Jenny? Is there any fear for how this first stage of the pandemic is panning out? 
Um, I know that sounds like, so it's like how long's a piece of string, um, but you'd hate to think because there's a lot of talk, wasn't there, in the press that there was members of staff who had nothing to do and were not on the COVID boards. And are we looking as if we might go back to the situation where everything's going to be stood down? Or no. Um, what? Um, I'll, I'll let him elaborate on that in a moment. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we have clearly been. Um, receiving pandemic modelling from our public health uh, uh, colleagues um, and the view is not if we will be in a second wave but when yeah. we, we, when is now yeah. um, and the issue is what will be the amplitude of that second wave and to what extent will we be constrained in maintaining elective capacity while at the same time it's been of the risk of patients the guidance we've received is that elective and ambulatory capacity is to, maintain, is to be maintained. The tone has changed slightly from at all costs to you will maintain escalation plans and only operational ones at the last possible moment. And I think that's the, the judgment we have to make. Um, certainly um, some of the numbers appear to be as significant as the first wave. Um, possibly the, the grading will look slightly different. But certainly, we would expect to have a long part in winter. So, whilst I agree with Mr. Scanlon, I think we're, we're uh, I'm more optimistic of our ability to maintain outpatients and diagnostics and emergency and urgent uh, uh, care that we partly stood down in March and April. So, there will be a difference in emphasis in how we manage the second wave because frankly there is no choice but to maintain our diagnostic position or outpatient position because we will be disenfranchising more people yeah. if we do not do that. So Noel is right, there, there will be a juggling act. Um, my aspiration, uh, our aspiration is that it will be treated like any other winter and when, at some point we will have to stand down more elective work uh, but it will be, uh, I would hope, January, February, as opposed to October, November. Um, but, you, yeah, who knows? Okay. <coughs> Just on outpatients, Jeremy, when I was out walking yesterday, I was stopped by a neighbour who wanted a rationale as to why he should be available between 1 and 5 to take an outpatient's call, as opposed to where if he had a a face-to-face -face appointment, he would be given it at a specific time. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's uh, probably slightly too long, and I didn't know that people were being. Uh, when I do an outpatient, mm -hmm. uh, I have a time to phone them, and that's when I phone them. Mm -hmm. So I would have thought we can. Uh, that's the first time I've heard that. So we mm -hmm. should be able to give people a a time frame that is slightly tighter mm -hmm. by an order of magnitude. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Any, oh, sorry, Paul. Well, I've got two sort of queries, I suppose, really. The first thing is, are, are, we, um, are, are we able to illustrate in a way that we, as non makes would understand the change in profile of COVID patients in wave two versus wave one, i.e. the dependency on ITU and specific equipment and the increased nursing and care that were required in phase one will not necessarily be required to the same extent in phase two. And what are the implications of that? I'm trying to gauge the extent. So the answer to that is not at the moment, uh, but if you ask us that question probably in the October and definitely in the November board, we'll be able to tell you. Uh, it's too early, given, you know, as Sue said, our numbers uh, when the Brett papers were written were in the order of 10 and we're now nearly 30 or we're over 30 patients yeah. so it is too early to say how um, uh, the, the profile of the patients uh, as to where they're going how much of it how many people are being ventilated for example by survival rates I suggest way too early. I think uh, just for assurance though about how we're managing so as I said as execs we meet three times a week we've got gold command with our um, colleagues um, in senior clinical and non-clinical positions across the organisation meeting formally twice a week. With the numbers and the increases we've seen it won't be long before we're on 
at sort of almost daily gold calls again. So what that allows us to do is to continually review both what we're seeing, how we're dealing with it and optimising. And I think back in March, um, clearly we followed instructions that were sent out by um, central government. But what has become very clear is that patients who had their services paused have become disadvantaged over a period of time. So there is a big emphasis, quite appropriately, on ensuring that we have no inequalities. And that um, that, that counts for both patients with COVID and without pa- COVID, but also if, for example, we're doing um, remote outpatient sessions, that we don't disadvantage <coughs> communities or individuals who perhaps can't access the technology. So it's a much more sophisticated response, I think, because we understand it a lot more. And I think we'll have a better ability to optimise everything across the piece. But it will inevitably change and you know, may change almost on a daily basis how we deploy our services, how we deploy our staff in the way that Noel has described. So what I think we'll be able to do, um, as Jeremy said, in October is give a bit more detail about the type of patients. But the big numbers have only just started coming in since the report was written. But we do already have patients in ITU. Um, which we, we've got three patients in ITU now. So that's quite a significant number all on one site. So um, I suspect that the final analysis about does wave two look like wave one in terms of patient profile might be even slightly longer in yeah, I, coming than, than Jeremy's described. Right, and as, um, as part of the reset, inbuilt adaptability and resilience mm-hmm. is absolutely part of what we've been working on for the last four months. Um, So we had a meeting yesterday uh, that Carol chaired about what we're going to do for the next wave and what was striking to me was the muscle memory um, related to what, frankly, we didn't know what we, well we didn't know what we were doing but we had, uh, it was very much being made up as we went along in March and April whereas this time round we do know what we're doing. Uh, Paul, the second part of my question was, we won't be the only organisation that have learned, that have got some learning as well to this, and I just wonder whether, what benefits the learning that our colleagues in primary care should have gained, will, how will we see some benefit from that, or, or, or won't we? So I think in some of the arrangements that we've described, so the SCG, the L- LRF, the lad b that we talked about in the um at the beginning of the report what we are is in real close contact with those colleagues so we have better uh, mental health support for our um, staff for example than we did in wave one we also have um, a better better cooperation collaboration in terms of how we're testing um, staff in colleague organizations so the Um, large parts of the infrastructure through which we're governing our response and planning our response are multi-agency and that's crucial and GPs particularly were very flexible in wave one standing up some hot clinics uh, sorry some hot um, services for us supporting our urgent care services but within just over a week we determined they weren't actually delivering anything (coughs) significant so they were deployed back but they've been invaluable in the community hospitals where they remain so I think it's um, collaborative working at a neighbourhood level that um, became very strong in wave one and hasn't really gone away and that we're standing all of those mechanisms formally up so we're planning together and we're delivering together and we're communicating all of the time. No, Steve. Oh, Steve. <coughs> In previous uh, board meetings, more than others have, have spoken about the extent of support that goes on the staff, which is great, great to hear. I'm just thinking as you were talking about a sex spike and things developing and all the rest of it. I guess my, my question was the impact of fatigue on, on medical and nursing staff and other staff. What are your feelings about that? Because this obviously is draining. Mm-hmm. You know, you've seen that and you, you described it. It's just something that sort of worries me a bit. 
It's interesting because we were talking about this as an exec and Jerry Jerry made a really good point because there's a lot of restrictions on our lives out of work that compounded with a very, what we think will be a very, very busy winter. Um, Jeremy came up with something very simple, which was what what can we do to make our staff happy, if you like. I know it's, and, and how can we give people bits of relief and, uh, you know, fun and things through what we can provide at work, whether that's, you know, the odd free pizza or whatever it might be. So um, last night we've got a close Facebook group with 4,000 people who work for the trust within it. And what we've done on the back of um, the thoughts that Jeremy had introduced into that executive discussion, we've actually gone out to say, what, what can we do? That recognising we're going to have you know, six months where it's going to be quite tricky, we're going to be very, very busy. Are there, is there anything that you think we can do as an organisation? So we'll start sifting that and um, we'll come up with you know, whatever, whatever um, is appropriate in response to what staff are saying. But I think that Facebook group, which didn't even exist back in March, that's been one of the new innovations, will be a rich source. And we'll find other ways to kind of communicate with staff. So I'm sure that we'll be able to get support for things uh, through local businesses as we did before as well. So it's just making, um, you know, uh, making staff's lives as a little bit easy and having and injecting a little bit of um, happiness in it in the way that Jeremy um, has described. I know that Facebook page has been monitored and responded, but I saw one yesterday where a nurse was saying that she's doing these extra hours, extra shifts. Will it be in her pay packet by Christmas? Well, I would assume it would be. It will. But it's entirely it up will. to her to make sure yeah. it's uh, Yeah, so it's submitted. automated. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, is there uh, something on fact? Just, just, just more than, yeah. more than a day. Five minutes, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So just on the um, best employer um, targets, the sickness obviously from August continues to reflect the additional levels of absence related to COVID in there. Um, so on that basis, it's, it's not wholly unreasonable, although as we bring colleagues who have been shielding back into the organisation, we are now being impacted by those that are being quite to isolate through either track and trace or what will now be the, the app as well. So there is a bit of fluidity around uh, that information. Um, appraisals obviously appear very low, but as you'll recall, they were um, suspended for the first three months anyway, and we are now faced both with that backlog and also uh, a rolling average, which means that while you've dropped off previous year, they are um, uh, the, the levels are much lower in, in any case, so we will hopefully start to see them increase, although given the backdrop of the conversation we just had, again, it will be a, a challenge, I think, to, to, um, to move those at a good pace. Essential training whilst um, being maintained through e-learning, which has, has been a really positive experience, unfortunately hasn't quite reached the sea heights of 97.75, it's actually 91.75, so I think that's a typo rather than anything else, but nonetheless that is, is still a really good level of maintenance, um, and I think also it reflects, as I say, people utilising the, the revised processes in place, so we continue to support that. Uh, the other metrics are there, and that's the way to see rates and all that as I mentioned when they are closing the building, that's everything due to the updated funds and previous past reports. Okay. Any questions for more? Yeah. Paul? Well, it's not a bit odd, but why did we just stand down appraisals when we're in the middle of starting the pandemic rather than run the risk of hitting the target but having rubbish appraisals. Perhaps there will be some exceptions I'm sure but it's a general rule just standing down one. Well. Uh, because actually the appraisal is there to support, it's always more important that uh, the staff have got somewhere to go and talk about their experiences in a neutral fashion. So, yeah, there's obviously a, a some link to rehab, for professional groups is, is that key link. They were officially stood down initially. We're obviously right for 
but I would reiterate Jeremy's point that we go back to our staff survey results, which always identify that we have a high level of compliance, but that quality discussion could always be improved if, if ever there was a need to ensure that we provide that window of opportunity, then I think this is it. So even if we don't budget as an appraisal, I think facilitating that time to have those conversations is really important. And that actually comes through the people plan as well in terms of requiring us to have a, a health and wellbeing conversation, we're linking in, in addition risk assessments to that process, um, and then obviously making colleagues aware of agile working opportunities. So actually this is a really good window in which to engage more fully and more widely. Um, you may be right actually, the compliance should be less important this time. I think it is about actually having that engagement and that quality. Um, maybe not quite so fastidious with regards to the paperwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. more about the quality of the discussion as opposed to taking every single governance box. Mm. Okay, thank you. That moves us on to David. Yeah, thank you for an update. The report provides uh, analysis of our run rate for the five months of the year to date. And um, if you look at all the specifically, what we see there is that we've made a retrospective claim um, of four one million pounds. That's a claim linked to both the costs of the ongoing COVID response and also income that we've lost as a result of COVID. Um, obviously that's consistent with what we've been running at during the, the course of the year so far. In terms of our cash flow, um, that remains positive. We have 50.5 million in the bank at the end of August. Um, that's the consequence of the financial regime paying us one month in advance, so paying us early to ensure we're able to then pay all suppliers very promptly to make sure we get the supplies we need on time during the response. In terms of capital, the report just identifies that we spent six million of capital to date. Um, we have just been made aware of a couple of additional uh, awards that we will be receiving from NHS England and improvement. We are getting £620,000 in relation to two CT scanners um, that will be replaced due to their age. And we've also been successful in securing £1.2 million of funding towards our endoscopy programme that will see um, both enhancements to the building at Bishop Auckland, but also additional scopes being purchased mm -hmm. to see the uh, recovery of that endoscopy work moving forward. Are we taking any questions? Questions? No? Oh, uh, Jenny, yeah. It's just mm -hmm. a, a query really will that include the ultrasound machine that we've been asked to run for the charity? No, it doesn't. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Okay, if there's nothing else, we'll move on to item number seven, Integrated Quality Assurance Committee preface, Michael. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> well, with the exception of the policy accounts, which were tabled at that quite everything else on the preface is either on the agenda for this morning's meeting or this afternoon, or has been raised already as a matter of variety today. So I don't think there's much need to go into any detail there. The, the one thing that it doesn't feature in the preface was a, a lively discussion about the uh, uh, conversations with the PFI partners about developments that, that I think um, Simon raised and Carol answered earlier. So that's caused that one as well. Mm -hmm. Very satisfactory, I think so. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Then we move on to item number eight, patient safety and experience. No. I'll take the report thread, but I'll pick out a few key features just that might be of interest. At the time the report was prepared, covered the period up to the end of August, there no MRSA bacteria. It's sad to say uh, we have had one since. Um, a few weeks is really uh, a very uh, short length of time. I've reported COVID-19 cases in sharp decline period that has reversed. Uh, but the government's measures that suit made reference to uh, remain in place and we monitor each case every day at the executive committee, both to detect most of COVID infection but also to monitor the impact on the organization and that's being managed. We are trying to move towards a more self-sufficient approach for FFP3 masks through the introduction of um, battery-powered hoods. Those have not yet arrived, sad to say. Um, and just supply chain and our agents with local suppliers, uh, national and international suppliers remains 
fraud. Um, however, complaints rates are in decline uh, within the confidence limits, and complements are up significantly. Um, antimicrobial consumption, which we thought um, was increasing and accounted for exceeding our monthly trajectory for Clostridium difficile, um, on further analysis, we now find it is declining um, and the situation with C. diff remains um, somewhat erratic, but uh, we are, are over our trajectory um, for that. Um, side room capacity is a major concern as the winter approaches. Uh, we talk an awful lot about COVID-19, but we also need to face the spectre of norovirus and influenza. Um, the staff and public information uh, vaccination campaigns for influenza uh, begin on October 1st. Um, within the um, SI report, um, reporting uh, a number of issues, there have been four falls uh, with harm um, contained within the report and an ENA incident which has been referred to the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch. The never event for wrong site surgery that I make reference to uh, upon further investigation has been delogged. Um, uh, Jeremy kindly chaired the root cause analysis serious investigation meeting uh, at which it was found that um, there had been a difference of opinion between clinicians, uh, but Jeremy is now confident, he'll speak for himself in a moment, that uh, uh, the wrong site was not biopsied. Uh, um, there is always learning in these things, uh, and annotation of photographic images remains important. Feature as well as a consultant center and operator, as well as involvement of the patient themselves. Now, I am also reporting this testicular torsion, uh, which may be partly COVID related. Uh, a virtual consultation was clearly not sufficient. The patient should have been examined uh, and remedial surgery offered much more quickly. Uh, and that's something we need to learn from. I've asked for a, a thematic analysis of the three missed testicular torsions that have arisen in the last four years. That we reinforce the importance of appropriate diagnostic features, not just from a medical point of view, but from a, a nursing feature as well. Uh, and there's also a case of a misdiabetic coma, um, which in part relates to um, some of the COVID arrangements where a patient was uh, uh, sent away and represented within 24 hours in a very precipitous condition, uh, but has now thankfully recovered. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you did ask for uh, an appraisal of our duty of candor position. Um, that is described there. You can see there are 98% compliance in quarter one for the 53 incidents that have been described. Duty of candor, of course, is a process and not an event. Uh, so it could be that the one omission in surgery uh, is a function of perhaps being reported at the end of that quarter. I don't know the detail, but that is monitored every two weeks at the patient safety forum which um, Joanne Todd uh, kindly chairs. Uh, Malcolm Thompson, our uh, new Interim Associate Director of Nursing for Patient Experience, uh, has been now, is now presenting patient experience indicators using SPC charts, which should be rather easier to uh, uh, interpret. Uh, and you can see that in relation to our, our comparative position with our neighbors, uh, complaints data appears slightly higher as I reported in the past, we believe that is a function of having more emergency departments than most of our neighbours. I'm happy to take any questions on that, um, uh, uh, but I would just draw to uh, Jenny's attention in particular that um, following the discussion at the uh, uh, Integrated Quality uh, Insurance Committee, um, I provided rather more detail around the NHS Friends and Family Test, which has been reinstituted. The National Patient Survey Program, some of which has been stayed, um, and uh, I think I've provided some explanation of the dissent posters, which is not about um, patients arguing in the street, but is about patients um, having the opportunity to contribute to the National Patient Survey, which is the language that the NHS uses to publicise that um, exercise. Okay, thank you, Noel. Any questions, observations from Noel? So, uh, just the mm -hmm. never event. Uh, essentially, uh, I decided that based on the evidence from the nursing nurse who had done the biopsy, mm -hmm. uh, that it was 
un highly unlikely that the wrong site had been biopsied. Right. Um, uh, accepting what other clinicians had said, uh, that was a judgment call mm. uh, supported by uh, photographic evidence. Mm. That's good. Thank you, Jeremy. If not, we'll move on to you, Jeremy. Yeah. Medical management. Thank you. Uh, mm. So, a uh, uh, brief report. Um, research and innovation, uh, as I've uh, discussed previously, James Lynn has uh, stepped down uh, as the director of R&I. Um, we have put in place Donna Johnston, who works for me um, as the interim director uh, until a substantive appointment is made. She previously was the manager of the R&I department in Sunderland, uh, so has uh, uh, enough experience to run the department on an interim basis. Um, so I, I'm quite comfortable about that. We had re-put it out to advert, uh, to close yesterday. There hasn't been any, any applicants. Uh, I have a plan um, uh, essentially to nurture a, a, an individual over the next six months to have them apply uh, in the spring. That's, uh, that's the, the current plan mm -hmm. for that. Um, indeed, the, the person that you'd um, yeah. uh, discussed and I um, talked to did not apply, even though they said they would say that. Uh, we've all done our bit. Probably. We can only try. We can only try. Mm -hmm. um, very positive with regards to uh, recruitment um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, 46 out of uh, 391 participating sites, which I think is very positive, and third in the region uh, behind uh, the RVI and uh, James Cook, as you can imagine, they are most research active organisation, so that is very, uh, very impressive. Um, we held our first uh, Clinic Eth Ethics and Law Committee, chaired by Edward Kanonga. Um, I think that will be a very positive addition to the quality of care that we provide in the organisation. Um, and then, medical examiners, um, it is uh, going out to advert for our medical examiners. We've sorted out our finances, everything got put on hold um, at the height of the pandemic. As you can imagine, um, we are out uh, to advert for um, five uh, medical examiners um, to work alongside uh, Sophie Noblet and uh, Sarah Jewell. So that's, uh, any questions with regards to those three topics? It's just to note that some very good research taking place in the Trust. Uh, you were reminded me the other day, Sue, about the work done by Anjanda around COVID, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. which is getting good profile, so it's good. Yes. Mm. Okay. Just the medical examiners, how are they, how's, how's the two we've got settling in? Uh, one of them is currently on uh, long-term uh, leave, uh, in combination of sick leave and compassionate leave. Uh, so it has not been as um, I would have liked in that they, their plan had been that they would run a ward, uh, doing the medical exam the role on that ward as a pilot study or pilot project. Uh, however, because one of them has essentially been away for the last eight weeks, that hasn't happened, uh, but we are still going out to advert for the other five. The, just to um, let the board know, from a medical examiner point of view, we had originally envisaged a model of uh, somewhere between 12 and 14 PAs worth of time. Uh, NHS England, uh, because of the change in funding, because uh, it's no longer being paid for by the party information forms because they've been stepped down because of COVID, it's been centrally funded. That um, uh, we're only being funded for seven PAs until we can then demonstrate that we cannot do two sites with seven PAs, even with a degree of where we're not working. So uh, we will not. Uh, achieve 100% straight away until we've got, uh, we've demonstrated that we can't achieve 100% and then we we'll get more funding. Yeah. Chairman, <coughs> just in respect of um, our research work, Mr Toomey, one of our consultants, uh, bariatric consultants, upper GI consult surgeon, 
um, wrote to me just this week. So he's the principal investigator for two national randomised studies and they've just recruited the 50th patient um, into the Sunflower study and he's written to me at length describing the excellent support that he has from the whole team. So I think we are definitely going up a gear in terms of our ability to support and the more principal investigators we can get, the better. So yeah. that's my long-term. really good condom. <laughs> That's the long-term plan. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions for? Uh, no? If not, we've got a paper guardian of safe working. Guardian of safe working, yes, indeed. So um, Hannah Wynn is the guardian of safe working. She's currently working uh, in intensive care at the moment. So uh, I offered to uh, give her a report. Um, this is. Uh, report for Q1, so it's April through to June. As you can imagine, that is a time of great uh, turmoil, especially for the junior doctors. Um, if I was to give it one thing that I wish we'd done differently during the initial phase of the pandemic, it would be to move the juniors less. Uh, that isn't in this report, but it is something that we've picked up uh, through uh, working with the Guardian. Uh, and the medical education team. Um, so it, it is there for information. I suppose the big take home message is that exception reporting uh, stopped, or didn't stop, but mm. people did not report. Um, so we got our information about how happy or unhappy the juniors were through other routes uh, by having a series of um, weekly meetings with the juniors on each site, so we did three lots of three, mm. Fishwalk and Darlington and Durham. We're now moving towards that, um, uh, a monthly junior doctor forum uh, where myself and the two deputy medical directors, uh, Shafi Cameradin and Rhea Willoughby, and the Guardian and the medical education team will meet with the juniors, so it's a much greater profile to mm. Uh, engage with the, the junior doctors, so um, hopefully the number of exceptions will still remain there. That's fair, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Simon? Yeah, just, just one briefly, Jeremy. It says there are a number of ongoing issues with some of the exception reports getting them closed out, so I can understand conversations are ongoing about some things and 10% remain open for significant periods. Is, is that just getting them to them or things that we can't fix? Or at what point do they get closed off? I find out usually it's because uh, it's an organisational issue between the um, trainee. For it to be closed off, the trainee has to make, meet with the trainer okay. to close it off. So if that meeting hasn't happened, they don't get closed off. Okay. So it's a logistical exercise. Okay. Any <coughs> other questions? If not, that takes us on to item number 10. Any other business? Um, no, please, formally of any. No? Takes us on to item number 11, which is the date and time of the next meeting. And item number 12, which is the um, that representatives of the press and other members of the public be excluded from the remainder of this meeting, having regard to the confidentiality of the matters being discussed, which may prejudice to the members of the public. So that concludes the open meeting for today. So thank you all. <coughs>